Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MetaQuest podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Amir Rosik. He is a serial entrepreneur, founder of Block Geeks. He's a philosophy junkie, and he's host on Amir Approved. Perhaps more importantly, Amir also used to be do crypto-related content on social media, just like myself, but he has moved on to more ethereal topics. The main topic of our talk is, well, I guess it's about how you can get to know yourself. I think we had an awesome conversation. And before I dive into the interview, I just want to give a quick thank you to the channel sponsor, which is Crypto.com. You can get an awesome metal, crypto, and fiat money debit card that you can use anywhere. You can also get a free $50 and 2% cashback. Just follow the link below this video. Without further ado, I bring you Amir Rosik. Welcome on the podcast, Amir. Thanks for having me, man. It's really awesome. I've actually been, um, I mean, I think I watched some of your crypto videos way, way back. And then I stumbled on your more philosophy-oriented videos recently. <clears throat> and I could just see that there was a development in the stuff that you were talking about. Um, and I couldn't help drawing some parallels to what I've been experiencing so maybe I should just ask you, what made you, did you decide, was it like a conscious decision? I'm going to stop talking crypto on social media. Um, yeah, like uh, one thing to be crystal clear is like, I, I wasn't originally just crypto YouTube. Like if you look at my YouTube channel, I think it was created. Oh fuck. It's been a decade. It's been a long time. Right. So 90% of my content is health related. So I used to compete, compete professionally in kettlebells. I did semi pro MMA. I was in the health space. So solid chunk of my uh, content development back in the day was uh, health related and then health kind of marketing related, helping companies within the health space and the marketing space. I got into Bitcoin six, seven years ago, but it wasn't until I started Block Geeks about three years ago that I started creating content. And it's more or less, you see my content, it's more or less like educational content. It's like, what is a smart contract? What is Ethereum? What is Bitcoin? None of this investing bullshit. Right. Um, I left, I, I, I want to say I left, I left the content space because I just got bored of it. I think there's not too much more to talk about. I think the space needs a very, very long time to evolve. That being said, I think right now is a perfect storm for crypto to see the value proposition, what's happening in the world. And I'm, when I speak about crypto, I'm probably going to speak about Bitcoin right now. Everything else is still very nascent. And so I, I, like to, I like to kind of evolve myself. So for me, life is about everything. It's about health. It's about wealth. It's about spirituality. It's about community. And so I always ask myself, what is something that if I were to die today, that my message can pass on to other people? And honestly, these types of crypto videos, it's not really. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I, no, I hear you. I, I actually pulled all my mind down. I mean, there's just uh, no reason for them to be there. But so uh, do you have a, an answer to that question? Why stop? No, no. Um, I mean, uh, the question you just posed um, mid sentence sort of um, what, what was it? What, what is it that you want to leave behind? I'm, I'm a firm believer in evergreen content. So timeless messages that no matter how old you are and where you are, people can, can relate to. And so like even topics I talk about, like I made a video day uh, yesterday about the stock market with my buddy Brad. And yeah, it's topical as in what's happening today, but the message is evergreen message. Mm. Uh, don't follow herd mentality. Don't fall into mimesis. Think for yourself. Use rational thinking heuristics, like tool sets and mental models that can prepare you. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your religion you can use these tools to better yourself. Right. I mean, I mean, you gave me a couple of buzzwords there that uh, probably one of the reasons I reached out to you as well is that, you know, I'm, I'm all about metacognition and, and sort of, uh, I don't know when I started that journey, but I would love to just ask you, uh, how did you, or rather, so, so the, the way I like to, um, to pose it to myself is at one point I realized that I'd been observing other people my whole life analyzing them nothing wrong with that per se but it, but i had neglected to observe myself so to speak once i started doing that i mean it just opened a whole uh pandora's box do, do you have like uh can you identify 
specific incident or philosophical journey or how did you how do you come to these know thyself realizations well i don't think so it's you know life is always a journey and you know, there's a joseph campbell saying he who thinks he knows doesn't know he knows he doesn't know knows and so mm. a lot of people try to play the spiritual card and like i'm enlightened you know, i hate when people like i'm a spiritual person <laughs> Get the fuck out of here like right away that's like a non-starter with me i'm not even going to talk to you all right that's all virtue signaling so at least for my case, it's just been life experience. I've gone through a lot. It's like more or less a sledgehammer has hit me in the head countless times. And through my experience of getting hit with the sledgehammer, I slowly learn. Now, hmm. there's only so much a, a person can do by themselves. It's very true that you are the product of your environment. You are the sum of your network. Um, you know, your network. So it's really important that you have a proper support network, your direct family, your friends, the businesses that you do or you work for, et cetera. And so you can have all the necessary tools and mental models and all that stuff. But if you're in an environment, and this is why I'm a firm believer in there's not, there's not so much thing as free will, but more or less your environment dictates how you behave, right? It's, it's a spectrum. It's not binary. It's really imperative that you control your environment because if once you set your environment for success, it's on autopilot. You don't have to think about it. You're not going against the grain. You're successfully creating a situation to behave in a certain way. Human beings are, are very rational creatures, but in an in a, in a irrational manner, right? Our emotions are irrational, but how we behave is very rational, very predictable. This is why we have psychology. This is why we have, uh, this is the whole world of marketing. This is the whole world of how, why, why do we behave a certain way? If I had to summarize it, it goes to tribalism. We as homo sapiens are tribal creatures. There's a reason why we have all these cognition patterns within ourselves more or less is for survival. That's it, bottom line. And so, uh, what's his name? Uh, Owen Wilson has a really good saying. Uh, he's a biologist. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technologies. So we like to fancy, <laughs> and we, we like to think like, oh yeah, we've really evolved. We're so much fucking better. Bullshit. We just got different toys right now. Right. That are piggybacking off our ancient primal pathways ingrained in our dna All right no yeah i uh, yeah i strongly agree with that and also reading ancient texts even just reading some plato aristotle and, and that kind of stuff you just makes you makes it blatantly obvious that i mean i mean these the deepest thoughts that we have these days they were around a long time ago there's, uh, there's no new thoughts it's all recycled <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I want to believe in uh, original th thoughts, but uh, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you on in that. In one shape or form. It's like it's one shape or form. Because there's that saying, Isaac Newton said, well, you know, stand on the shoulder of giants. A sudden, poof, you have this genius new philosophical insight or you have this new mathematical formula. No, you've used pre-existing formulas or frameworks or models to extrapolate ideas and theses from that to create your right. idea and thesis. Yeah, and that's also essentially, uh, at the end of the day, maybe what creativity is, it's just taking things from here and there that don't usually belong together, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. reassembling them in a new well, configuration. What he talks about in uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra in its Metamorphosis, the final stage is a child. You're How right. Right. Well, what, what's the what's the reasoning behind that? So, like, you know, so you have the so how it goes like it's three metamorphoses. The middle one is a camel lion child. Yeah, camel lion child. So camel is how much of a load can you take on your back, right? Then you got to grow into a lion to to defend against thou shalt, and thou shalt is symbolized by a dragon. So a dragon like to, likes to guard things. So thou shalt not do X. Thou shalt not do right. Y. So that's a dragon. Think of the metaphorical symbolism of a dragon in a cave guarding gold. The dragon is you, your ego. And ego is not good or bad. It just is. And all these narratives and stories, it's guarding. It's protecting against yourself. But you as a lion have to fight your own dragon, thou shalt, to right. overcome your own programming, to eventually metamorphosize into a child of play. So... <laughs> Leaving the man-child syndrome, or they call it uh, recently, they call it the uh, Peter Pan syndrome, 
and to evolve into a man and to evolve into a child. So but you've, you've, you've evolved your psychology. It's a nice synergy emerging of both having an adult body, but having the respect of creativity as a child and viewing the world as play. It's all a theater uh, as opposed to viewing the world in very binary thinking, a very strict thinking, non-creative thinking. Listen, human, the, the, the very nature of homo sapiens is creativity. You know, we're not the, we're not the most strongest. We're not the most fastest. We are tribal creatures. And through our creativity, we've become masters of earth. And so we're, a lot of that is missing today because let's face it, the masters of the world today is actually not your phone right here. The masters of the world today, for the most part, are the social media algorithm engineers, people who are responsible for the machine learning and the AI engine that stimulates the content that you see. Yeah. Let's face it, more and more, time, more and more people will be spending time on social media, even though the data telling us the opposite, meaning we should be doing the opposite. Jonathan Haidt but does this well in his book, uh, Coddling of the American Mind, primarily for young women, right? Adolescent girls from the age of, like, say, 10 to 15, a lot of issues. Boys have issues as well, not as much as young females. And so you're being bombarded with all this content on a day-to-day -day basis. So subconsciously, it's programming the narratives for you to think a certain way, which ties into what I said earlier with Rene Rajard's uh, philosoph uh, philosophy take or philosophical take on mimesis. Is it really you thinking for yourself or are you just following the Joneses? Which in the case of social media, it is. Everyone's following everybody. It's, it's rare. It's a, it's a rarity for a person to go against the grain because A, you get ostracized against the tribe. Right. B, you're left by yourself. C, back in the day, if you were ostracized from the tribe and you were expelled from the tribe, good luck surviving by yourself. Yeah, and especially good luck procreating. Yeah, but times are different. <laughs> times are different, but, but there's been a massive selection pressure on what you just, just described. Oh, yeah. And that's also, I mean, I mean, I just love when my, uh, <laughs> when, when my, uh, some of my, my social media connections, uh, complain about hurt mentality and, and stuff like that. Cause it's like, yeah, but, but at the end of the day, when, when you, if you have <laughs> like some sort of theoretical understanding of why, why we are as we are, are and how we got to the point we're at today, I mean, the selection pressures, not just, I mean, there are multiple selection pressures, but um, it's really not that hard necessarily to understand, to see why we could get here in the first place. But, but I'm, I'm still interested in, so, so you, but, but if, you, um, if you ran into your own 16-year-old self, mm. would he have any understanding of this meta-thinking concept? Oh, I was a crazy conspiracy buff when I was 16 doing a shit ton of drugs, a lot of psychedelics. I never went to high school or university, so I was a, okay. vag a vagabond. Um, yeah, like it, obviously not to this degree, but I think also it's not the, it's not the message that matters, it's the messenger. Meaning, mm. so a lot of people, this is where, where ideologies come into play and where you have people, whether it's the left or the right, of all different spectrums, arguing um you can have let's say for the sake of the conversation we say you have a good message like we'll use this example of me talking to my 16 year old self i can be like hey amir don't do this don't do that because i can't relate i don't understand the context you're coming from so just like in sales or going back into like more primitive stuff like understanding human behavior and one of my favorite books for this is um don't split the difference by chris voss Oh, I've read it. I just read it six months ago. Yeah. Really, really, really good. Book, that's a great right? book. Yeah. There's like one chapter in there. He's like uh, the chapter of that's right. Where you know more of your <laughs> opponent's position than the opponent knows themselves. So you're, you're literally in their mind. And so okay. this is why I'm saying it's very important from the messenger aspect, not the message. The messenger needs to talk at the level. So if I'm talking to my 16 year old self, I have to relate to my 16 year old self. I'm not going to be like, hey, well, stop drinking, stop doing drugs, don't party. Get the fuck out of here. It's a non-starter, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I guess uh, Kierkegaard actually said that. I mean, this is uh, on the fly, uh, 
translated quote here, but I think he said, you, you have to meet people where they are, mm -hmm. so, so to speak. Uh, but it's very true. And that's actually, I mean, I'm watching your videos, uh, at least, I mean, clicking the ones I'm especially attracted to. It strikes me that there's a certain element of frustration that motivates you sometimes to create the content you create. Is, is, I mean, is that correct? Or mm. No, I want to say. Am I just? Pro I'm projecting here. Okay, that's. I can see why most people think I'm a. Uh, by nature, I'm an angry person, or uh, <laughs> I have like a very strict energy, which is true. I'm a no bullshitter type of person. Right. I don't right. like fluff. I don't like bullshit. I like get to the point, man. Like I mm. hate email corresponding. Like I hate people text me. Just tell me what it is. Like right now, boom! Don't waste my time. Like, like, tell me. Right. Uh, right. And so for me, it's more or less stuff that I find interesting and stuff that I want to have more clarity as well. So the process of creating videos forces me to clarify my thinking. Mm. Uh, some of them that I've made in the past, I'd have to script it out. I wouldn't read it word for word, but at least once I'm writing it, I solidify a little bit more. I cement it. Right. And so I do it for that reason. And plus, I think it's help, helpful for, for people. As long as it can help one person, that's what I care about. As long as one person finds benefit from it, I'm happy. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that uh, I guess we can get into entrepreneurship a little bit. Uh, and I think you already alluded to the fact that it's obvious that, I mean, mindset is key. But if you do have uh, <laughs> an adequate mindset, I guess one of the things that it was a huge eye opener to me, I guess about 10 years ago was, I mean, I used to hate rules, sort of the rebellious side of me, which is ah, rules. I oh, mean, that's just the worst. But then I realized I can make my own rules, right? Sure. Actually, there's a great video. Um, oh, some uh, entrepreneur from the UK interviews Jordan Peterson. I think it's the only Jordan Peterson video I've seen on entrepreneurship specifically. But he says that, yeah, but if those rules force you to do something, that you want to do, that you love to do. I mean, that's not, that's not the way I framed it uh, when, I, when I realized this, but I can make rules and adhere to them. But I'm the creator of the rules. So I'd be a complete moron for not enjoying that ride. I mean, I mean how, uh, do you, how do you go about, do you make rules for yourself? How do you, how do you go about creating a, a structure? Well, this goes back to what I said about systems the rules that you are relating to are the environment that you're going to behave in and content. Well, that, that depends on your view on rules and your degree of resistance to the concept of so rules. For me, for me, context is key. The rules that apply in China are different than the rules that apply in Canada. Mm. The rules are different in Canada than the rules are in Kuwait or in, or South Africa or Uzbekistan. And so a lot of people try to blanket statement everything. Same idea, same rules, same philosophies, same everything across the world. It's not the case. You know, if we can go back into Dunbar's number of 150 people per tribe, this is why we're never gonna have global cohesion. We're not meant to have global cohesion. I can't have a personal connection with the fucking billions of people around the world. This is why communism and socialism will never work. There is no, the state is not my family. My family is my family and my city is my community. But even then I live in a city of like 8 million people, GTA in Toronto. I don't, I don't know one, 1,000 of the fucking people in my city. How can I relate to them? How can I connect with them? So Nassim Talib was it Nassim Talib? I'm pretty sure Nassim Talib said it. He said it the best. So context matters and levels matter. Context. I can be a communist with my family, no problem. I can be a socialist with my friends and my extended network. I can be a conservative with my city. I can be uh, what I can be. I yeah, know I can be a conservative with my province. I can then, from federal level, I need to be a libertarian. So, at the smallest nucleus, you can be in a communist system. I have absolute trust with my family. I know them. I grew you up share with everything with them. I share everything with them. Right. Same with friends. Like, you know, go to the bar, go to the restaurant. I'm paying for this. Share gifts. We have a deep unity together and connection. I don't have that with 10 million people. On the highest level, federal level, 
you can't have the same rules apply for everybody. You can't be giving out everything to everybody. We have to have more or less libertarian open systems where you're allowed for people to experiment differently across, across let's say, the country. But that's a whole different conversation. But um, yeah. I always try to relate to we cannot, ex- we cannot escape human nature. We can't escape how we are programmed as tribal creatures. So let's use our innate genetic programming as tribal families to create better systems. You were talking about this. So back to the meeting, your, your own 16 year old self. Sure. I mean, I used to work in social psychiatry back in uh, Copenhagen, mm-hmm. Denmark. And in many cases, it was really obvious that, okay, there's this person that I'm mentoring. If he or she could just make these adjustments, for instance, remove themselves from this super damaging, um, non-success conducive environment, and, 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 and it's, it's, it's easy. They even have every opportunity to do so. But I know that there is no way I can just say this directly to this person. I mean, I see it with content creation too. When I make a video on a niche topic, uh, some, some, some little malfunction that we all, or a bias or a heuristic or something like that, that we all suffer from that I consider highly useful. I mean, there, there are only two types of people that watch those videos, 90% people who already agree with it. And then 10% that are just there to disagree with it. And, and there's no, there's no level of reflection in the comment, uh, commentary section of the latter segment. You know what I mean? It's just, you're wrong. Someone wrote, I remember this comment, of course we have free will, period. I mean, mean, that's a discussion to be had about that. I mean, mean, if that's your stance, that's fine, but you need to, I need to see some arguments for you. But how do you, I have two questions for you. First of all, how do you reconcile with that on a personal level that that probably 90% of people would disagree with most of what you believe? Or or do you even think that's the case? I don't know. I've never dug into it. I personally just don't give a shit. Right. right. Okay. So that's that's an answer to the question. Okay. So question two, how do you try to, how do you try to meet people where they are? I think just being honest. You know what I mean? Like if you've, if you've made a mistake in the past, come out and say, I've made a mistake and I've changed my mind. And we're not here to please people. Once again, this is our tribal behavior coming to play because we had yeah. these people in the past or else we were kicked out of the tribe. Or as you mentioned, the most important thing, we can't procreate anymore. Right. <laughs> that was our, that's our driving nature. And so I think social media is also a very horrible medium of conversation. You know, there's a lot of keyboard warriors or social justice warriors, all mm-hmm. these warriors online but you meet them in person for the most part they're way better you can have a really good conversation like wait a second um we have way more in common than we have differences but there's that disconnect right there's a safety feature where like a lot of people are anon so they are anonymous and so they have these um, dummy accounts so there's no repercussions to their behaviors they can ask act like bullies online Uh, And a lot of times too, is like, I think a lot of people are still children in adults' bodies. They're probably the psychological level of like a 10 year old or a 12 year old. They haven't really evolved. They're taking responsibility. And you know, it's a fault of many different variables. A lot of times to the parents, to be honest, it's like, there's a situation where the parents weren't really parents. They didn't educate kids. And, and the crazy thing, the crazy thing is this. You know, a lot of people are hypocrites. They'll be like, and I made a video about this. Do what I say, don't do as I do. But human beings don't behave that way. You know, babies and humans have mirror neurons. This goes to mimesis. Uh, We copy through, we copy osmatically behavior, characteristics, traits, language, all this stuff through observation. Right. Not by you telling me what to do, right? And, And just for the record, much of that observation happens unconsciously. Unconsciously. Right. Yeah, it's like I, my first language is like Yugoslavian, Bosnian. I never went to fucking school for this shit. You know, I had to go to school for English because English mm. was my first language because my parents didn't speak English when they moved to Canada. Right. Right. So I, I, I picked up a language. I picked up their aneurysms. I picked up their, character, uh, uh, their characteristic traits osmatically. And so mm. when parents 
our parenting, uh, it's not what you say, it's what you do. Right. Right. And so then as a child, and, you, and this is why it's, it's hard, you know, it's about breaking that chain, right? You see your, your, your mother behave a certain way. If you're a daughter, for the most part, you'll behave that way. If you're a son and you see your father behaving a certain way, most likely you'll behave that way. And so it takes something very rapid, quick, or maybe even slow, for example, psychedelics, to snap you out of your programming over time to realize, wait, a lot of these narratives and stories that I have in my head are not mine at all. Um, you can be most, a lot of, uh, there's two categories I say. People are born with disabilities, both physically and mentally. And at the exact same time, people are born with physical abilities and physical, um, uh, sorry, mental abilities, both, uh, both from a physical aspect and from a psychological aspect. Mm -hmm. so there's both pros and cons. The genetics I get from my mom and my dad, I can't change. I, well, not at, not today. Maybe <laughs> you could get a CRISPR, but a yeah. CRISPR. yeah. <laughs> right. for, now, yeah. for now, we can't change it. And then we have <clears throat> epigenetics, which programs my genes, how I behave, and my environment dictates my epigenetics. So, so my social economic class, uh, the type of nutrients I got from my breast milk from my mom, how my mom and my father's relationship was, how it was in the womb. You know, actually, the womb's most important. Like, what, what was happening when I was in the womb? Was there caffeine intake? Was there argument? Like all this stuff, right? All these yeah. stuff plays a role in the epigenetic programming of my genes. And so we have this default package that we're born with. And as we age, as we get older, and let's say maybe this starts happening, people in their like early 30s, let's say, or maybe even younger, you, re you come to a conclusion sometimes for some people, and this is why like psychedelics are good or uh, yoga is good or challenging yourself is good to kind of step away from your natural routine and start challenging your narratives that you have in your mind. Right. And it's not about good or bad. It's not like, mm, well, how you think is bad. Right. Not that late, but just the, the very notion that you're willing to be open to the fluidity of different narratives is massive. I think that that, that door opens once you get a type of made up perspective on your own ego mm -hmm. in some sense. Like, and, and for me, one of the ways to do that is probably, I mean, looking into evolutionary biology, psychology, I mean, biology in a, in a more general sense as well, but just understanding that at the end of the day, I am a biological creature. And for some reason, this configuration of atoms <laughs> creates the experience of an ego and of consciousness and of free will, whether all those things are real. I mean, that's, that's almost, I mean, it's definitely a philosophical discussion, but it, it quickly turns into a, even a metaphysical discussion. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but just understanding that, I mean, in, in, at least in one sense, you don't have to go <laughs> uh, all the way with this, with this realization, but at least in one sense, those things are illusions. To me, that makes it much more easy to look at, to accept criticism, to adjust, to examine myself. And once I've examined myself, ironically, it becomes much easier to examine and predict other people's behaviors and thoughts and motives and, and all that stuff. Well, this is Maya, as they talk about. This is come again? Maya, all an illusion. Everything's illusion. Like in, in you look at right. the works of Schopenhauer or Jung or Joseph Campbell, we wear masks. Our masks are metaphor. In fact, our masks are protection from trauma that we experience when we're younger. Now, the masks aren't good or bad. Trauma is not good or bad. It's just a fact. You experience something. I don't know what that something is, but you went through something and then your ego is a defense mechanism. And so you have these masks that you put on to, protect, to project mm -hmm. into Maya as an illusion to protect the trauma they experience at a certain stage in your life. Uh, this is why, like I said earlier, I like psychedelics as it dis it's a disillusion. It sheds the masks and kind of forces you to go on a ego trip. You know, so it's, it's, it's not like, you know, you have meditation. It's good. It takes a very long time to get there, but you know, taking a hero's journey of four to five grams of psilocybin or doing some peyote or even people who have PTSD, even for myself, one of my best results is uh, MDMA. 
a good uh, good protocol for MDMA. And uh, that's kind of a shortcut where it's like, oh, I have to actually deal with this right now. What am I experiencing? Hey, you have to. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> I would say like don't do it by yourself. Like if you can source a facilitator, somebody that can, because there's a protocol. People think you're just going to take it for the sake of taking it. Like any medicine or any journey in life, there's a protocol, there's a process to take. So most people will take some psilocybin and go to a party or MDMA or whatever, LSD, but that's not how it works. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's about journaling. It's about writing. It's about analyzing the feelings that you went through. So there is, there is a kind of a systemic process when it comes to, uh, I call it peeling the onion, right? So the onion being different masks that we have and getting to that child in the middle of the onion and right. time to slowly peel all those onion layers. Right. I mean, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of uh, psychedelics uh, too. I mean, I don't, I, 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 I don't have any protocols or systems for it. I'm, I mean, I generally try to, it's just a rule of thumb, like once a year, uh, mm -hmm. no more, no less, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but that's, um, but that being said, I'm, I mean, I've, I've, we could talk probably about many realizations, but I remember like a specific realization I had once, um, this, I think it was like 12 years ago, probably one, well, probably one of the first times I did mushrooms. Um, but just this whole, when, when, when someone present said something, it just immediately became part of reality. And I noticed that, I mean, while I was in it, yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, my, 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 my ex, she would ask me, are they looking at us? Are they talking about us? And then immediately they were talking about us. But I mean, I mean, no, I don't think they were. I don't even know who they were, but it was just bizarre. But yeah, I don't I know what experience like that. Well, right. I've had times where me and my friends were on shrooms and we're looking at exactly the same fucking thing, seeing the same mm -hmm. illusions at the exact right. same fucking time. That is bizarre, right? Many times, not one time, many times. So what is, so is that, so are you actually seeing an illusion or yeah. is the illusion rather when you're not tripping? Yeah, well, there's also like, is this already, are these, these are the same pathways all humans share. So the psilocybin's acting on the same pathways of the brain. And so therefore we're seeing, but it's like, so it's pretty spooky. It's like, you know, the last time yeah, it can there. be so specific. Oh, please. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, like we're at my cottage and it backs onto huge, uh, like forest. It goes acres and acres behind my cottage. And so we, for my, my first rule of thumb, it has to be nature. That's, that's like sure. non-negotiable. Like I have to be around nature, whether it's beach for nature, some type of nature can't be just me crammed in my apartment. I could, I have to be grounded barefoot. I want to be outdoors. I want to be connected. And so we're staring at this like shrub, in my forest, just on the outskirts of my lawn into my cottage. And we're all seeing the same fucking thing, the same color, the same, same, same movements, the same. It's almost like it was speaking, but wasn't verbally speaking to us. And I'm like, yo, you fucking see that? And mind you, we weren't like on four or five grams. I think we did like two, two, and a, or two, two to three, somewhere between that. And all of us, all four of us were like, yeah, I see exactly the same thing. That is bizarre. Right? I mean, I, I, I wish someone would, would, would explore that scientifically, but I mean, there are some obvious obstacles to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's really exciting. I mean, it, 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 sometimes it can almost only be interpreted as mind reading, but at the same mm -hmm. time, you like what you're saying, oh, yeah, we're having the same, same biological effects happening in our brains right now. That, that must be it, right? But I mean, that's still weird. That doesn't explain. I mean, it just poses more questions the way I see it. So I, I usually run through five bonus questions. They're like rapid fire, but w w you can take your time with them. Um, sure. They're a little crazy, but I actually thought before that, I would love to just talk a little bit about, I think you mentioned in one of your videos that, or I don't know if you post the question, why do people feel guilty about making money? Mm -hmm. Do you have, um, is it social ostracism we really fear or... Why, why, why do many people have it like that? I think it has to, has to do with their background of their family. And so a lot of people, and let, let's be honest, 95, not 95, probably like 99 or 98% of the people are working paycheck to paycheck. You see it right now with the economic crash, like even 
literally before this interview, where it's March 17th, I don't know when this is going live, but Trump was talking about a UBI plan. I'm like, Trump, UBI. I'm like, what the fuck? Um, and so our That's system, crazy, man. It's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> That's all different can of worms. But for the most part, um, I think the modern theory of money or the modern narrative money, it's ingrained from the problem of not having the necessary tools to make money. And so you grow up as a child and you're hearing problems with your parents, money, this, remember most divorces, I think something like 80% north, uh, 80% of north of divorces has to do with this finances. And so this is ingrained to you. And so you have a psychological belief system. The money's evil. And this goes to the classical tale of, um, Oh fuck. The Fox fable tale. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar a, with the a, a Fox fable. Where the sour grapes, so yeah. the fox keeps on jumping up to grab the grapes. It fails, and he's like, "Fuck!" It jumps up again. Anyways, it does it a couple of times. It keeps on failing. Eventually, he makes up a story in his mind that the grapes are sour. Right. So he does it so he can justify the fact that he's failing. Yeah. The same thing when it goes to money. You need you need to have a justification, which goes to mimesis. There has it's not your fault. The sins right. must be passed to somebody else. It's passing the puck. The sins can never be on yourself. So the psychological premise or the narrative to protect yourself from failure is the fact that money is evil. But, but it's still a harsh realization, though, because at the end of the day, um, I mean, not all people are either cut out to start their own business or oh, I, I, mean, not. I, I don't even know if, if, if everybody did it. I don't, even, I don't even know if that would be possible, honestly. Um, I mean, that's, that's another discussion. And then some people, again, may be capable of doing it. I think a lot of people are, actually. But it's just not their thing. You know, they just prefer the nine to five. They prefer regular holidays. And I also suspect you're in Canada. I grew up in Scandinavia. I, I mean, there are some similarities um, mm -hmm. in terms of the, yeah, I mean, just the, the general sense, I think. I'm making huge assumptions here. I've never even been to Canada, but I, I know a couple of Canadians. Um, but I, I think there's, there's more of this, um, I don't want to call it a socialist way of thinking, but, um, but, but I guess that's what it is, essentially. We have, but, you know, for the most part, we are, we're a mixed economy, more mm. on the socialistic side. Like, we have a socialistic healthcare system. Listen, um, it does help a lot of people, but... But the problem with these systems is it creates complacency. Uh, complacency is not good. Uh, man, so that's, uh, um, I mean, I think we actually have some, we probably have some disagreements on that, but, but, uh, but I, I used to, I used to say the same thing and, and I, and I do agree in some areas that that is true, but well, then I, I look, uh, but then I look at some statistics on it, man. And, and, and the, the usual talking points that, I mean, people, Uh, don't want to work. Uh, I mean, it, it's, I mean, I mean, at least the the local statistics for for Denmark, Scandinavia. No, no, I looked at it; just work. wasn't true. Yeah, people want to work. The problem is this: I'm not against. Okay, if you're going to have a system, have an open system. So, for example, in Canada, we don't have private health care, and in our healthcare system, for the most part, except for emergencies. So, if you have a broken arm or if you need something like this, it's good. Mm -hmm. Anything else is fucking shite. Like shit, I, I have a liver issue. It's non-medical emergency. Mm. So for me to go see a nephrologist to scan my organs, I got to wait eight months. Get the fuck out of here. I'm going to go okay. drive to Buffalo. That's an hour away from Toronto. And I'm going to pay a couple hundred bucks and I'm going to get my results that day. Right. And so you can have both. What I'm proposing is an open system where, for example, uh, with the socialist healthcare system, let's have private as well so they can compete against each other. Uh, you're going, well, I'm, Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're referring to UBI. I'm actually in, I'm a proponent of UBI only under the circumstances if we eliminate modern day welfare. The welfare system is completely fucked, beyond fucked. So UBI is exponentially better than the welfare system. Well, the welfare system creates incentive models that are completely broken. So it's like, we'll give you, I'm just pulling numbers in my ass, but something around, it's like, we'll give you. I think it's around 20,000, something like that. And depending on how many kids you have and all these different variables. But right. we'll give you $20,000 a year. Um, however, however, if you make more than $20,000 a year, we won't give you anything. And so the person's like, yeah. well, the best job I can get can only give me 30. Then I'm working full time. I'm just going to stay at 20 and work cash underneath the table. 
right? And so it, it doesn't actually make room for you to grow at all. I, okay, so, so I agree that that is completely retarded <laughs> but, but in spite of the fact that I do think that I don't even think a lot of people would, would do that. I don't think, I mean, I mean, maybe but they don't uh, want to do that. But the problem is like for them, no, but I don't think they would do it, but that's besides the point. Um, yeah. That's just a, a stupid way of, um, I mean, of constructing that system. We can definitely agree on that. I mean, I wasn't actually talking uh, UBI per se when I, when I made that statement, but I, I guess, I, so I guess in Denmark, they've gone from, having a very like if you had a job and you lost it you got laid off i mean the company uh, went uh, down uh, down the drain or something like that it would be so easy to really just go to a public office and say i lost my job and they would support you i mean the government would support you for up to two years you wouldn't re really have to do anything and then and, and actually honestly that worked pretty well because people were motivated, everybody, I mean, no one wanted to be on this relatively Is low. Is that 100% of your wage? We have that in Canada. No, 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 not, no, wage? not at all. Not at all. It was probably something along the lines of yeah. 100 grand a year. Or, oh, not, not 100, 20, 20 grand a year. Um, but, but then they sort of kept that system in place, but they started tightening the grip. You had to demonstrate that you apply for at least three jobs each week. You need to go to, go to training. And if you, if you tell people, yeah, but I'm a double PhD, like, oh, no, you still need training. There were, there were some horror stories about, uh, I, think, I think a PhD in something had to take a job as a newspaper boy in the other end of the country. And if he turned it down, he would basically lose, lose everything, more or less. But it was just bizarre. But, 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 but again, I mean, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that UBI is the end all solution to all problems, but I'm certainly open to, to trying it out. Let's, let's try it. I'll, I'll tell you the solution. Let's hear it. We can't have centralized governments. We need to have decentralized Plato <laughs> republics. But, but if they're small though. Of course they're small. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that that's about city by city. This is what we should have okay. a libertarian government that our taxes go. And I'm believing in flat taxes. I don't believe none of these convoluted bullshit tax schemes. Flat, mm. flat fucking tax. No income tax though. Income tax is robbery of my, of, of my labor. Tax me on anything else. Tax me on gas and oil and all this other stuff. Consumption mm. tax. Your past, like the VAT tax. Uh, but no, no income tax. You want me to save money? Don't fucking tax my labor. Like fuck off. And so basically what I would have is libertarian government, very small government, very li limited bure uh, bureaucrats. Everything is audited. Everything is accountable. The whole country can see the balance sheet, like everything. Their job is military protection of the nation. Their job is infrastructure. And their job is private property rights. Without private property rights, you can't have a civilization. That's the first, first metric or the first domino in a healthy civilization is a protection of private property. And obviously then protection of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of this, yada, yada, yada. Sure, so, sure. Right. And then you have provinces that act like countries that can dictate their own tax policies, their own any, everything policies. And then you have the city that has their own policy as well. So what you create is a game theoretical model where people compete. Uh, Switzerland has cantons, it's kind of similar. It's a good example to show. Uh, United States originally was based on Plato's Republic. Each state, and slowly the amendments change, and federal government came in and had more superseding power than the federal uh, than the states itself. Mm. But originally, it was not uh, one nation. It was a united. That's why it's called the United Fucking States. It's mm. a unity of different states. It was sort of the other way around from what you just described, almost. But okay, but, so Amir, but uh, I know you read uh, Sapiens. Um, yeah. Uh, what's his name? Yuval, um, Yuval Noera. Yeah. Uh, Yuval Noah Har Har Harari. No. <laughs> Harari. Okay. Harari. Harari? Yeah. I mean, I don't know why it escapes me. Yuval, Stay Yuval Noah Harari. Okay. Harari. Let's just call him Harari. But, but I mean, he really, I, I mean, I've had this dream since I was 16, probably mm -hmm. about uh, small states. I'm actually even a fan of a strong state and I am, I'm even going to go as far. They don't have to be a libertarian. I mean, I don't call myself a libertarian actually, but, but even, even in, in the scenario you described, not all those city states or smaller states have to be libertarian. What could be a fascist, fascist state yeah, as long as it's, want. As, yeah, exactly. Right. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, that could totally work. But as I read Sapiens, A Brief History of Mankind, 
I, I mean, I really think he laid out a very strong case that uh, we're really, the, the global trend, uh, literally and uh, figuratively speaking, um, is centralization. We've gone from, I mean, we're more people, so that, that should be taken into account as well, of course, and, and the whole internet thing and the, all the algorithms, all that tie in with this I agree as with well. you. We're heading towards centralization, but mark my words, it's going to end in the worst fucking disaster ever. Oh, man, I'm, I'm, I mean, um, what, what do you mean? What do you see? Let, let me hear what you it see. It goes against the very nature notion of how nature behaves. Nature is a decentralized grassroots movement. This is how biology and chemistry works you cannot have the same rules apply to every single human humans have different cultural value propositions um the humans have different views about the, about the world for you to have proper human behavior and proper human incentive you need to create an open free market not even market replace the word just open society where i'm a sovereign individual where i'm allowed to express myself this is why i said china will never become the superpower they have a bunch of shit you can have all the money in the world but you don't have any creativity this is why no pop culture comes out of china this is why you don't have any innovative <laughs> startups yeah. you just fucking steal shit from everybody else you don't think for yourself everything's stolen because they're not allowed to think for themselves you think for yourself you're fucking dead right you end up gone period the doctor yeah. that talked about COVID-19, where the fuck is he? He's gone. The lawyer that publicly was speaking out on Twitter, where is he? Incognito. Who the fuck knows? He's dead for sure. Mm. And so the very notion of one fucking Sauron's eye staring at everybody, well, if you watch the movie, you see it collapses. It, 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 really, it will fucking implode on itself because it's going to be like the Ouroboros, the fucking tail eating itself. But what, what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the actual evidence that it will inevitably implode on itself? Human so nature. Human nature. You yeah, but they to, could they they they, they could control. I mean, so one country is doing it right now, and they what? How much are they like twenty percent of the total population in the world? China. Yeah, they're very close to imploding. Yeah, but I'm I'm just saying they they've reached that point. Trust me, um, implode. Human okay. nature. Human nature is the human nature is about. I would say rebelling. There comes a point of the Overton window, and it changes very fast. And every Overton window in every country is different. The Chinese, through their history with uh, Chairman Mao, who's killed hundreds of millions of Chinese, yeah. through uh, Xi Jinping right now, who's who the fuck knows what's going on with him and how many people underneath his thumb, to the concentration right. camps with the Uyghur Muslims, that's 2 million in northern China, through probably the second worst country on the planet with human rights right after North Korea. Eventually, as I mentioned, it's not outside elements that destroy system is internal elements. The right. Boris eats his own tail. Your own citizens will have splinter groups off. This right. is the very, this is, this is nature. Nature, there's not a status quo. There's no story that's continuous in nature forever. Everything comes to life, must degrade back to earth. There's no different than civilizations and empires. Empires rise and empires fall. Look at every great empire. Think about the Romans. We control the world. Bro, the Roman they they fucking did, right? <laughs> and guess what happened then? They're nothing. They lost it. Yeah. Ottoman Empire, Persian Empire, Mongol right. Empire, Mughal Empire, Chinese Empire, Japanese, all these empires. Right. Huge fucking massive empires crumble. Crumble. They all crumbled. But as Harari also points out, they typically crumble and become absorbed by an even bigger neighbor, by a now even bigger empire. Something else that I just want to, I mean, I think we agree on the, the fundamental uh, aspects of this really, Amir, but one thing that worries me a little bit is when we have these people, they're actually, they're preaching freedom, they're preaching individual freedom. For instance, in the US, I hear people, oh yeah, but I have my religious freedom too, right? But what, what they're actually doing is they take a groupthink mindset. Typically, they pass on what, what their pastors have told them. And who knows where they, they get their uh, orders from. And then they use this. It's a fake narrative of individualism, of individual freedom. But in reality, the, I mean, and the, the, um, the way I see it, this is just my take on it. They brainwash people by the millions, by the tens and even hundreds of millions and make it appear as if they have more freedom when in fact 
just the opposite is happening. I mean, that's not what, what China is more like classic fascism, right? We're just, you should just do this or you, you just oh, disappear, right? Dictatorship. But, but I, what I see, for life. right, but, but in the West right now, what I see is people who are smart, who have a couple billion dollars, that's really all you need, know how to use social media, well-connected, they can fool people by the hundreds of millions. What, what, do you have any thoughts on that? Or do you even agree yeah, with that analysis? Formula. It's skin in the game and who has something to gain. That's it. Right. The behavior of people is very, is very but simple. No, but I want you to solve the problem. <laughs> can't, you can't solve the problem. You know, you're dealing with a lot of complex issues. You're dealing with capital R religion as an institution, which is quite different from underscore R as an individual. Right, religion. right. That's very the true. Two, two different things. And I'm, I'm, a hard, I'm hardcore against organized religion as a capital R, as in the institutionalization of religion. I'm more in the individualized religion as in do whatever you want to do. I don't give a fuck. We definitely agree on that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Amir, okay. Let's move on to the bonus questions. I mean, they're not completely unrelated to this, but uh, I do want to respect your time. And um, th I love this bonus question, honestly. What is, what is a thing that you used to believe, but that you no longer believe? Oh. Mm, something recently I was... Uh, I thought going to the military was the most stupid, idiotic thing possible. And then, you know, I had a lot of my friends that went there talking to more people higher up within the military. And then when I started understanding the benefits that you get from the, not just from the skills that you learn, like even myself, I never went, I'm looking to go towards some military training, like hands-on military training to learn some stuff next year. But it's the discipline that you are being taught it's the camaraderie, the brotherhood that you're engaging in. Right. It's the mental aptitude that you're developing. It's actually the great, it's a really good uh, skill set to apply in regular life, especially if you want to be an entrepreneur. Like these are like how to be anti fragile, how to tackle problems, uh, how to be a leader. Um, right. But I'm not in the camp of, uh, of the US shit where it's like I'm going to be sent out to a fake war like Iraq or all these fake wars. I'm in the camp, like, if I can go and be a reserve to protect my country, I'm not really, I'm not a nationalist per se, but protect my family. If an invader happens, that's a different story. Mm. If the rules are for you to go into the army, but you have to be deployed to a fucking proxy fake war like Iraq, no, no fucking way. Right. No, or even a real war. I mean, I mean, war is hell. But it's it's actually interesting that that you choose that specific uh, topic. I'm because I'm. I mean, I, I I there is a draft in Denmark. I don't even know if there is anymore. But I was drafted, so I did four months of military service. It's mandatory. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think I don't think it is anymore. But it was okay. when when I was eighteen. Um, I mean. It was great, man. But at the same time, I, I, I still, oh, every time I hear people oh, support our troops and see the little stupid stickers, I'm like, ah, oh, dude. I'm, but for the individual, I mean, it's such a formative experience. I mean, well, Canada even, has a decent, <laughs> decent program. You can go to the reserves and they have a contract where. Who, who's that? What, are you signing up? We'll come again? In Foreign Canada, Legion? Well, they're in Canada, there's a reserve, so you can sign mm. up. And by right. me doing it, but um, there's different levels of the reserve. And one of the levels is you can sign a contract saying like, I don't want to be deployed. Okay. So Fair enough. Case, like, like reserve, like maybe like national emergency stuff that you can help around with. Right. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things I changed my mind. It's like, I thought like, you must be a fucking moron to go to the military. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? like, right, right, right. Fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, man. Okay, so this, this next one is easy. If you could allocate, I don't know, I'm just joking around, I guess. If you could allocate a trillion dollars to research in one area, uh -huh. which specific area would you donate it to? A trillion dollars. One cash. trillion dollars, yeah. In the industry to help people. Yeah. Mm. So this is about the leverage here. What is the return on investment for human sapiens? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I I guess the question was posed as to research in something. Yeah, yeah. To but, but you can to benefit sure. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. You would want you, you know you would think it would be energy, but the problem even even solving the problem of fusion, so to eliminate fission, but going to fusion is like who controls the fusion? 
So the energy source is still controlled, even though it might be unlimited freeze sun energy, like we have the sun in the palm of our hands. So that doesn't really solve anything because still somebody's controlling that unlimited energy. Mm. Um, ideally for us to move on as a society, I think we have to start upgrading our emotional belief systems. Um, so I had, a, I had a good conversation with the co-founder of a single, a signal single, <laughs> Uh, the uh, private messaging app. Mm. Uh, so that was Moxie. And uh, where were we? We were in, yeah, we were in K uh, Kiev, Ukraine. And I was, okay. we were talking about blockchain and crypto, yada, yada, yada. And I asked him his thoughts about decentralization and computer software. And he says something interesting. is like, we will never, ever have proper decentralization and proper growth of a new type of society until we change human behavior. It's not technology that makes people better. It's people that make people better. Same thing with guns don't kill people. Mental illness kills people. You know, this is why you see in the UK a huge rate in knife stabbing and acid throws. They're gonna, you eliminate guns, they'll bring a car or they'll bring a knife or they'll bring something else. It's the mental illness that's the issue. So I would invest a trillion dollars in how do we create better mental health how do we create better, and mental health is the most important thing. You have better family units. So if we go from the nucleus of a society, you have the family. We need to procreate. Like people think we have too much people on the planet. It's actually the opposite. We have too few people with the birth rates that are going on right now. Um, too, so too, too, few, too few birth rates. To what? To what? To the growth of our, so if, if we're looking at how, how can we support the elder population, how do we support the growth of all nations? We need a healthy workforce. So let's say from the age of 20 to 45. This bubble of demographics is the most disappearing around the world right now. Right, but, 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 ever, oh, please, please go on. First time ever in Japan, they're selling more adult diapers and baby diapers. And <laughs> even though China has a population of north of a billion people, they've only had a birth rate of 40 million babies. Right, but, um, but, but, but you have to recognize that that's, um, I mean, I mean, there's no way the population will ever be be, be able to grow forever. No, it doesn't go. For, it doesn't grow forever. But we're actually we've gone to the polar opposite. We went from even like a nuclear family of two children. To okay, okay, child. gotcha. Sometimes, right. Like so, some places are having zero kids. Like this place, even Quebec here, our province, we have. Mm. They're paying you to have more babies. People aren't even having babies. Like right. my wife deals in fertility, so she's a fertility doctor. Mm. So even people that want to have kids biologically there's issues right now we're having kids later the eggs obviously if you're a woman after the age of 20 24 25 it's all fucking downhill from there mm. you have all these other cofactors like estrogen in our water and our food supply and all these other sure. chemical and pollutant health. just yeah. Yeah, yeah all this stuff and it's giving us a very difficult um time to conceive and this is why ivf is on the fucking sky rise like everyone yeah. has fucking ivf today and really fucking expensive it's like twenty thousand dollars each treatment and i think that's for like a socialized uh, system might as well private is like 100k treatment and so for me it's like how do we create healthy unity how do we create healthy mindset so we have a healthy family a healthy family creates a healthy society and so that's my, I would focus on mental health, like throw a trillion dollars into like psychedelics, biofeedback therapy, uh, meditation, like everything. Like let's upgrade our fucking software in our mind. Okay. Awesome, man. Yeah. I'll give that some thought for sure. <laughs> okay. So the next one, free will, illusion or real? Illusion. Illusion. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Do, do you see any good, have you ever heard any good arguments for the, for the opposite? No, not really, to be honest. Nothing that convinces me or even makes right. me ponder and say, hmm. When, when, when did you realize that? Hmm. Mm. That, that's definitely not something a rebellious teenager. Or, I mean, no. that's not a natural thing to realize, no. I think. Hmm. I wouldn't say there was like one moment that said, aha. I think it's kind of like an inception. Like you read something and you watch something, you talk to somebody. And slowly over time, that idea kind of percolates and grows. And yeah. And you realize it's the only reasonable option, right? <laughs> I think for me, like my, my, my cementing moment, not my aha, uh -huh, but like, I'm like, okay, finally, I kind of accept this thesis was like analyzing my past behaviors, why I behaved that way. And they all came out to the same conclusion, regardless of the circumstances I'm in. Like, this is why I behave like the way, that, that, that way. And then the stuff that you read, like interesting papers, like I, I'm fascinated by would be like, 
Nick Bostrom's uh, simulation yeah. theory. Right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's like, for me, and people, mm, let me put it this way, people view it as fearful. I don't view it as fearful. I actually view it as like enlightening because it's like, okay, the moral of the story is figure out how you're wired. Like I mentioned yeah. earlier, there's, there's your- Know genetic. thyself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's genetic makeup, right? Then there's epigenetic, which is software. And then there's my environment where I am. So for example, Canada, Toronto. Cool. Uh, I'm going to behave a certain way in this circumstance. Like any software, if I put software in a Mac or a Windows, it behaves differently. Same thing with the phone, right? Cool. What is the best environment based on me to stimulate the best productive behavior of me without thinking of it? This is the key. This is why your fucking environment is so important. Like example, I can't do it now because we're in a quarantine so the gyms are closed. But classic example not too long ago. I was part of a really nice gym. I mean, like top up gym, right? But it took me fucking 20 minutes to 30 minutes to get there. And you know, sometimes it's like summer, it's nice outside. I'm like, fuck the gym. Or like it's winter here in Canada. It's like snow, fuck the gym. So yeah. both occasions, like I don't want to go half an hour this way, nor half an hour that way. I'm spending an hour of my time. There's uh, a gym that's like maybe... 25% as good as that gym, but the fucking gym is I can throw a paper plane for my house. Yeah, that's what you want. I can, I can literally like fucking do a jumping, uh, like a, uh, like I can jump across the street and I'm there. <laughs> like I literally, it's right there. It's like I can go my underwear to the gym. That's how close it is. Mm -hmm. So my environment dictates my behavior. I yeah. don't want to think about it. Like I don't want no will, there's no willpower, none of this stuff. It's like, right, it's right. Like, I'm going right to it. There's no excuses, it's right there. Right. I mean, but that's actually a fascinating realization. I remember I, my, my wife told me at, at one point, there's a specific type of chocolate that I love. Um, and, and she told me, don't buy it. Just don't. I, I mean, I don't want it in the house. And I, I, mean, I, I mean, what do you mean? Like, you're so weak. You can't just just leave it in the cupboard. Yeah, I'll, I'll eat yeah, it, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I'm actually, I, I realized later that she was smart, actually. Just don't have it around, right? Man, just if I have cookies or chocolate in the house, Right. get the fuck out of here. It's you, you know Toblerone, that chocolate Toblerone, yeah, the fucking, yeah. I know right, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. like heroin to me. I could, yeah. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> that, you're not gonna have one. No, you can't. You're gonna, you're gonna, like, you're gonna have one bar. <laughs> uh, that's bar, okay. That's right. yeah. exactly. Exactly. Okay, awesome, awesome, man. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, have you ever had an experience that you, at the time, experienced as supernatural? Hmm. I don't know about supernatural. I've been in a lot of close call death situations when I was younger. So okay. I was stabbed. I've had guns pointed at me and I was shot at. Um, I've, gone, I've gone through some interesting car accidents. Um, I've OD twice off of party drugs. Wow. Uh, so I've gone through a lot of those near death experiences. That, I want to say I've never had like an out of body experience. That stuff doesn't phase me per se. Um, the most spirit, I don't like the words, but the most I felt out of my body and almost visualizing myself as myself would be when I was semi pro fighting or like in general fighting. Like it's almost as if everything around me is white. As right. uh, think of like horse blinders like this. I don't hear anything around me. I go into this like super fucking laser focus. The zone. Right. The zone, you know, like me, yeah. I mean, Chen Si Hai talks about the flow state. Right. And uh, it's almost as my body is on autopilot. I'm not okay. thinking at all. There's no thinking. Right. You can't. By the time you think, it's too late. So everything's already, it's already there. And like I've had experiences where in that process, I felt like I'm watching myself fucking fight. Like I'm not mentally, I'm not there. It's like my, my whole body is just right. autopilot, just doing its thing. That's awesome. Man. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I probably would call that a spiritual uh, experience. I mean, I don't know what other word to use, That's but, but, I, but I've right. gone through crazy psychedelic experiences, like the most crazy ones, but I've never been like, Oh, I've just talked to God or something. No. Right. And that's, you that's know? exactly what I was uh, asking. So, so you did answer my question. Okay. So there's, um, there's the legacy question. Now I want you to tell me what is the single question that you would like more than anything to have the answer to? The single question that I'd like to have an answer to. 
like assuming you could just ask me a question and I I, I have um, God on a speed dial and I'll ap- actually be able to answer it. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, I just recently realized that I've been asking all my podcast guests this question, I but I, I don't know how to answer it. <laughs> any answer I get from a, like a, a superior being, call it God or whatever, would defeat the very notion of the human experience. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why I introduced God into this. Okay. That was really just a metaphor. I mean, I mean, just I'm, I'm really just interested in your curiosity, like which direction that it points in. Hmm. If I can ask any question, get an answer for that question, what would it be? Let's see, my, I'm going to play this out. So my question has to then benefit, not just myself, but benefit everybody else. And so quite, getting an answer for something random as if God exists, I really don't care. Like I've had this conversation with my friends a bunch of times and there's a lot of like, I've had some friends who are super religious, God exists. I'm like, okay, it does. doesn't change anything in my life or the earth is flat okay, doesn't change anything in my life. Or like lizard people exist. Mm. Okay. Like none of sure. this fucking affects my life. What's, if you tell me how it could take go- copper into gold through alchemy, that affects my life. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make some fucking gold. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so unless it directly affects me, I don't give a fuck if it's true or not. <laughs> um. You know, it would be an interesting question because it would actually, it, it would, it would completely destroy the paradigm of reality that we live in. If we knew for a fact, and if we knew what it is, and if we had a mathematical formula, is there something faster than light? Okay. You're talking, you're talking on a, on a physical level, obviously. Is there something faster than light? This would completely, we would have to rethink every fucking formula we've ever created because all the formula is based on the speed of light. Yeah. Okay. So this would affect all of humanity from the get-go. Everything, all our science, all our biology, all our chemistry, everything that we know today of how things work will be completely affected if we find a particle or some kind of, quasi subatomic small particle yeah, yeah. Kind of weird, that, <laughs> right, goes, right. that goes way faster than the speed of light right, right. awesome man so uh, here's when i so this is when i tell you that i'm actually going to ask the next next guest on the podcast this question yeah, yeah. i don't know if you knew that uh i mean and that also means that now moving on to the final question i'm asking you a question that under strong pressure uh elizabeth stoko who is a, um, a language scientist from the uk uh asked and she just asked will the uk ever get back to europe i don't know you if you're qualified to to answer that question but Whew. let's hear your answer <laughs> i think a better question is is the eu as the as a european union even going to exist in the next 20 years that's a very good question yeah i personally say no i I, i'm not against the eu dollar i think the dollar is smart i think the european union is retarded and i'll give you i'll tell you why there's no such thing as a european identity non-existent yeah um bosnia croatia serbia we're very different in germany england france ukraine Scandinavia, Poland, very different from Western Europe, very different people, different religions, different moral belief system, different languages, different fucking problems. So there's no such thing as this European entity. Like people forget Europeans were fucking fighting each other for thousands of years. Yeah, I mean, I'm European too, so I I remember, (laughs) but I I know what you mean, yeah. Uh, Hasburg Empire, German Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, then the Ottomans came, and then like Prussia, then Russia. Oh, it's just one big war zone, essentially, yeah. Yeah. Um, I I think a European Union needs to disappear and I think every country needs to go back to their own currency and I think the EU as a dollar can stay and I think for them to have better fiscal policy was just have better trade agreements with every country that's it and I'm a firm believer in competition United States originally had many different currencies from different states that competed until central banks came and the whole thing even fell apart once they uh, de-pegged gold in the 70s so for me I'm like okay 
sure, keep the euro, have the euro as a European peg. And the only reason the euro created was to compete against the United States. And you'll see United States, will be, the euro price will be crashing soon. Uh, I'm a firm believer in competition. Have each state have its own currency. This is why I love, one of my favorite places in Europe is uh, the Czech, is Prague. Uh, yeah, I've been a couple of times. It, oh, I love it. Beautiful. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I love it. And so forget this whole European Union bullshit. You can keep the currency if you want, but open up trades. Just make it open. That's it. Okay. All right. Well, that's an answer. Hey, man, I, I mean, okay. So um, I really just want to ask you at this point, like if people want to hear you, follow you, where would you want them to go? Or? Uh, the best would be probably YouTube. Just type in my name, Amir Rosick. And then uh, I'm not active on Facebook, but I'm quite active on Twitter. If you want to reach out to me, just my name, Amir Rosick. So A-M-E-E-R-R-O-S-I-C. Okay, awesome, Amir. And I do want to say before we wrap up, I mean, I love to talk to a person who doesn't believe in free will but still calls himself a libertarian. We really should talk at some other point in time about... I'm programmed to think as a libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> I know That's why. I, I've, actually, no, 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 I've, 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 I've analyzed myself why I think this way. <laughs> okay, I'm going to sleep on that, give it some yeah. thought, and uh, I do think we should... We should uh, Let's do it. Discuss that some other time. But thank you so much for, for this talk. Awesome talk, man. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, cool. Awesome. All right.